<laughs> if we take care of it, we can have it forever. Today on This American Land. Right, so shoot right hand. No fun in the sun spring break for these students. What are they doing in the Grand Tetons? In such a short time, we bond together as a team and just as individuals. And what is killing all the frogs? Across the globe, millions of amphibians are dying. Scientists are trying to jump out in front of a deadly disease. If something is wrong with the environment, the amphibians will suffer first. And it's a thrilling ride, but are too many snowmobiles threatening the peacefulness of Yellowstone? The amount of machines and the amount of people going into the park skyrocketed. All this and more now on This American Land. Funding for This American Land is provided by the Weiss Foundation. The Turner Foundation, the Daniel K. Thorne Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trust. Hello, and welcome to This American Land. I'm Caroline Ravel. And I'm Bruce Burkhart. On every show, we'll take you to some beautiful places that you may never have heard of, but we'll do something more. We'll bring you thoughtful stories about protecting America's natural resources. We have reporters from coast to coast covering water, wildlife, and conservation issues. We'll dig into stories about threats to our natural heritage. We'll also introduce you to some people working to find innovative ways to preserve our natural resources for the future. In our first story, a lot of college students, especially from the South and big cities in the East, are getting a taste of a career in the Park Service. It's a program full of surprises. Gary Stryker has our story. This isn't your typical spring break, especially for these 30 college students from across the nation. I'm from a really small town, so a lot of people back home haven't even heard of the Park Service. So it amazes me when I tell them, hey, you know, I'm coming to Wyoming, I'm going to Colorado, and they're like, why? <laughs> Landing in Grand Teton National Park, these students are part of the first ever National Park Service Academy a program designed to recruit college students from diverse backgrounds to careers in national parks. Obviously, before all this, I never heard of national park systems. When I thought of a national park, I thought of Yellowstone. But I've learned that there are national parks back in Georgia, essentially everywhere in the United States. For some, especially those from the South, it's a new frontier. We barely have this much snow in South Carolina, and we go crazy over this much snow. Uh, so this is a lot. And also, you don't want to walk in that because it's, it's a pretty <laughs> easily get all wet. The idea is to immerse students in a park environment. So rather than do a recruitment fair in the summer, which is usually what we have done in the past, service-wide, this time we took their spring break, brought them into a national park, and introduced them to potential career fields. Careers ranging from law enforcement and engineering to wildlife management and interpretation. They even learned how to rig ropes and package patients for mountain rescues. It's all part of a larger effort to diversify park employees and visitors. It's important to, to the National Park Service that we reflect the face of the American public, and we are not doing that now. Our workforce is typically white and aging, and in fact, in the next few years, over 40% of our workforce will be retiring. Those retirements will create an opportunity to recruit more minorities. When I was here all week, and I see everyone presenting, there's very very little minorities. You don't see many different faces, and I think that's really important because in your average workforce, there's so many different people. And so I think the national park system also needs to be like that. I think this program is especially um, taking that head on by bringing us out here, by showing that the government, by, that the national parks are committed to bringing in a workforce to the parks that is more reflective of the American population now. This academy is part of U.S. Interior Secretary Ken Salazar's initiative to get America's youth engaged with the great outdoors and to prepare the next generation of natural resource professionals. Like many here, Courtney Goulding is a city kid 
He grew up in Teaneck, New Jersey. I love the concept of being in the outdoors, learning new skills, and the possibility of, the, of an internship after this experience was something that I couldn't pass up. Snowshoeing was among the new skills he's learned. It was a surprise how, at first, everybody was uncomfortable with the snowshoes. At first, we were unexperienced and we were unsure of ourselves, but in such a short time, we bond together as a team and just as individuals and get to know each other better. <laughs> Park officials are hoping that a more diverse workforce will attract more diverse visitors, which they say is key to the future of national parks. The last uh, few decades, our typical visitors have been white and aging, and these places are for all Americans. And unless they care about them, they won't preserve them. As these students return to college, they're already gearing up for summer internships. If this academy succeeds, those internships will be a first step toward a career in national parks. For This American Land, I'm Gary Stryker. Academy participants are taking part in internships from Mount Rainier in Washington to Acadia National Park in Maine. I remember when I was a kid, there's no more fascinating way to learn about biology than to watch a tadpole turn into a frog. But frogs around the world are under siege. The enemy is a fungus called chytrid. More than a third of the world's frogs, toads, and salamanders are threatened. Miles O'Brien has more in our Science Nation report. This is just wonderful. Oh yeah, there's lots of newts here. This is great. Just another day at the office for biologist Vance Vredenberg. On this day, the office is a pond in a protected watershed east of San Francisco, where he and Jessica Purificato catch and examine frogs and salamanders. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is just measure what's called snout to vent length. While the animals in this pond appear healthy and plentiful, biologists are shocked by what they're seeing around the world. Disease, pollution, and loss of habitat are killing off these historically tough, resilient creatures. More than 30% uh, of the world's amphibians are in trouble right now. So for example, amphibians have been on Earth for over 300 million years. So long before the dinosaurs ever you know, conquered the Earth and then died off, amphibians were already on land. They were the first vertebrates uh, to be crawling and hopping around on, on land. I gotta get his little feet. See his little feet? A swab of this little guy's feet will reveal whether it's infected with a deadly widespread disease called chytrid. Breedenberg has been investigating chytrid with help from a grant from the National Science Foundation. It's a disease caused by a fungus. So the pathogen is a, an aquatic fungus that infects the skin of amphibians. And this is what we've been finding lately. The size of the frogs are about the size of a small bullfrog, you could say. And here we've got some bones of frogs that have been uh, basically eaten by aquatic insects. Another complication? Climate change could be making the fungus worse. There are some people that think that uh, it's climate change itself that's triggering this release um, of, this, of this pathogen from being potentially something that doesn't cause a problem to some, something that's suddenly really, really deadly. These samples are from Little Indian Valley and near the Sierra Nevada is just a little north of Yosemite National Park. Graduate student Natalie Reeder is screening those samples to see if chytrid DNA is present on the frog's skin. But the numbers of frogs are dwindling so much in the Sierras that um, on this last trip I went on, I was out for about four days off and on, and I only came back with maybe 40 samples. Friedenberg is trying to determine why some populations can recover from the chytrid fungus, while others are wiped out. Is it something about that particular habitat? Is it something about that particular frog itself? Is their immune system a little bit different than the ones that are dying off? Um, or is it possibly a different strain that's less deadly of the fungus? But while searching for those answers, scientists are at the same time doing whatever they can to save these animals. When these animals are dying left and right, you can only, as a, um, you know, as a person who cares about these amphibians, I can only document that for so long. And then at some point I was like, what can we do about it? 
Here's one thing he did at the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Lab. He set up a sort of amphibian spa. Instead of a milk bath, these critters spent several days in a medicinal brew. And I was able to get permission from the National Park Service to go in and actually treat some of these animals with antifungals. Many of those amphibians, microchipped after their treatment in 2006, have been caught again and are disease-free. You got one. Cool. Back in the field, an adult salamander oh, yeah, gets cool. a once-over. You can see that he no longer has external gills, and his skin is rougher now. Uh, we share a lot of traits with, uh, with amphibians, so I think it's really important that we understand um, as best we can um, why these outbreaks of disease are occurring. Because creatures as spectacular as these deserve another 300 million years. I'm Miles O'Brien. Around the world, zoos and research facilities have launched captive breeding programs. They're getting out in front of the spread of this disease to save at least some of these threatened amphibians. Gary Stryker has more on one program in Atlanta. The blue poison dart frog from Suriname, South America. Horned marsupial frogs from Panama. Amphibians rescued from a deadly chytrid fungus by scientists in Atlanta. The chytrid fungus eats away keratin, a component of amphibian skin. This causes a disease named chytridiomycosis, which is fatal to adult amphibians. What we're facing is literally a situation where there's more species of endangered amphibians than there are of birds and mammals combined. Amphibian chytrid fungus gets in the skin and it reduces their ability to regulate their water balance and can kill them very quickly. In 2004, Atlanta scientists were able to identify the path of the spreading fungus and realized a pristine national park in central Panama was about to get hit. We knew for the first time in history when and where the fungus was going to strike next. At the time, there wasn't a facility in Panama to do this, so the animals were brought back here to Atlanta. And since then, several species have bred successfully. Crowgaster punctariolus is probably among the rarest frogs in the world. Uh, these were rescued from El Valle, Panama. Somewhere around 20, maybe two dozen of the species in Panama at the facility there. And we have seven here in Atlanta. Amphibians are considered the ecological canary in the coal mine because of their extreme sensitivity to the world around them. Uh, they're environmental indicators. Um, if something is wrong with the environment, the amphibians will suffer first. They have their double life, is what amphibian means, and they're living in aquatic situations as tadpoles. They're absorbing whatever's in the water. As adults, uh, they have very permeable skin, so they're absorbing any chemicals in the environment. The rise of infectious diseases like the chytrid fungus is a symptom of greater problems, pollution and global warming. Scientists are doing their best to save these unique species that face a threat confronting all of us. For This American Land, I'm Gary Stryker. Some of the most dramatic amphibian population declines associated with chytrid have occurred at high elevations with cool temperatures. There's a long-standing myth that if something is good for the environment, it's bad for the economy and vice versa. That's not the case for the hugely popular sport of fishing. Sharon Collins from Georgia Public Broadcasting got some quick lessons on saltwater fishing from some very passionate anglers. Jack, get that line out of the way! Jack, jump! It starts out fast. Whoa, yeah, he's on. Ha-ha! All right! Woo! This would not be the only time Glenn kissed Ooh, a fish. Look at him. Pretty fish. Golly. This part is puzzling. They cut bait, then they put the bloody stuff in a pouch around their waist, then go waist deep into the water where there are sharks swimming around. Now they may know how to fish, but you will not find a bait pouch around my waist. There were lots of things biting, but not what they wanted. They cut that bait in hopes of catching red drum, sometimes called redfish or channel bass. 
They are so popular, the state protects them with size and possession limits. Many, including all the big ones, are caught and released. Well, it's sometimes it's kind of a tough thing for a new fisherman, and this is the biggest fish they've ever caught, and they want to take it and, and take it back and brag on it. But, but I carry a digital camera, and, and a, and a high-resolution image is the best thing you can do because you get to let the fish go, you bring the image back, you got the best of both worlds. True to his word, we had photographs to document every catch. And as if on cue, Spud's wish for redfish came through. They started rolling in. Man, the slots are out! And they are beautiful fish. When they reach adult size, they're called bull reds. The largest one on record weighed just over 94 pounds. They are known for a large black spot on the upper part of the tail. Scientists think that spot may fool predators into attacking the tail instead of the head, allowing the fish to escape. It's drumming. Oh my goodness. Feeling? Yes, feeling? yes. It's yes. drumming. I feel it. This is an odd thing that only the male does. It produces a drum-like sound. It's not the same as a heartbeat, but more a thumping sound produced when a muscle vibrates the swim bladder. The sound is produced during mating or when the fish is stressed. I'm on a natural high. As Glenn hooked another fish. Come on out here. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry about getting wet. It's not going to hurt. I was ordered into the water for a class on Red Drum 101. Yeah. Now go down and reel. Now come up and use your rod tip wearing him out. Look at the pro. Oh, look at that. Whoa, now let him run. <laughs> That's a good one. Now look at the red color in this one. Wow, now you see what's red. Look at that. Oh, wow. <laughs> no thanks. You can, uh, uh, you you can, can kiss, kiss your hand and kiss him. <laughs> there is obvious respect for the red drum. Anyone who kisses a fish on the lips has to think pretty highly of the species. But then this sport is a big deal to a lot of folks kiss or no kiss. More Americans fish than play golf. And the millions they spend on equipment, licenses, even boats, gives a nice boost to the economy. Saltwater fishing, both recreational and commercial, pumps more than $500 million to the state's economy and creates at least 5,000 jobs. But as many fishermen point out, all Georgians can have an impact on their sport and livelihood. Fishing is one of those things that if we take care of it, we can have it forever. If we take care of the habitat, we take care of the fish populations, it's a sustainable form of recreation. But we've got to be vigilant now and be good stewards. Uh, and it starts with, with water quality, and that's what I tell people that, that come down maybe from Atlanta. I said, believe me, what you do in Atlanta, Georgia, affects the ability of, of us to catch red drum on these sandbars down here because that water comes down the Altamaha River. It's all connected together. Solid advice. But the rods tipping over are crew spots of fish, and this one is mine. Okay, this is fighting me. Yeah, it's fighting you. That's sort of part of the whole thing. That's a good one. Yeah, you got a bull red. Don't hear that. It's understandable why they call these the bull reds. I can hardly hold the rod. This is hard. Use that rod tip. That's it. Use the rod tip. Look at the bend on that rod. <laughs> Man. Oh. <laughs> Look at that. Good, Dad. Look at that. Here's another important lesson. When you release a fish, you can't just take the hook out and throw him back. Hang on to the tail to make sure the fish has its equilibrium back. Only when it's upright and trying to swim should you let it go. Right. There you go. Hey! Right, ha, ha. <laughs> good coaching, good coaching. It's been a good day, but it's time to get out of here. So, there's one undeniable truth when it comes to fishing. Your luck can change in a minute. Sharon and her crew changed locations. Look at what it did for their success. Yeah, this is unusual to not have a, a bite of any sort. 
There were moments. Nice trout. But despite several hours cruising along Georgia's coast, the pickings were slim. As most fishermen will tell you, fish can be fickle. On another day, we found that St. Simon's Beach is all that it should be. It's free to anyone who wants to play here. We move the poles around and change the weights in an effort to trick the fish. Even with all the special bait and the tricky weights, our catch today is dismal. See, the waiting would drive me crazy. It's all part of it. Good things in life you gotta wait for. Is that what your mama and daddy told you? <laughs> That's not what my mom said. Go for it. Sometimes it's more about the fishing than the fish. For so many hundreds of years, we spent every moment of our life connected directly to nature, you know, because our life depended on it. And now, you know, in the last 200 years, we have begun to be separated from nature because it's all provided for us and, and we grow out of touch with it. And fishing is one of those things that reaches deep down into the core of your brain and wakes up those little memories. Of, of, of what you used to be like and how you related back to nature. And that's why there's no substitute for it. You know, you can sit in your living room on a video game and have a simulated fishing experience, but there's no water washing over your feet. You know, there's no wind in your face. There's no, you know, squeaking sand under your toes and birds hovering over your head. I mean, you can't duplicate that. And that touches a part of the human brain that nothing else can touch. And fishing is just a good excuse to go do it. <laughs> For This American Land, I'm Sharon Collins. Trout, salmon, bass, and pike are among the most popular fish caught using fly fishing. One of the most popular ways to see Yellowstone National Park in the winter is by snowmobile. But those machines can be a threat to its serenity and air quality. Gary Stryker has our story. Yellowstone National Park is a winter wonderland and a favorite destination for visitors in snowmobiles. We find that a lot of people from across the United States uh, enjoy going into the park on snowmobiles because it, you know, you're out in the fresh air, you get to see things on a snowmobile. With your guide, you can stop and take pictures. But conservation groups have been seeking to ban snowmobiles here for more than a decade. Even snowmobile enthusiasts now admit the machines became a problem in the 1990s. The amount of machines and the amount of people going into the park um, skyrocketed. A lot more than I think anybody had ever predicted or thought would happen. And as a result, it probably did get a little out of hand. With as many as 1,400 snowmobiles a day entering the park, blue exhaust fouled the air and squealing engines shattered the natural quiet. The National Park Service cracked down with restrictions, today allowing just 318 snowmobiles a day. Visitors are required to ride cleaner, quieter models and go with commercial guides. The changes have improved air quality and reduced noise and impacts to wildlife, but conservation groups say it's not enough. The National Parks Conservation Association wants snowmobiles banned in the park and replaced with multi-passenger snow coaches, claiming government studies show modern snow coaches outfitted with the latest technology cause the least environmental impact. Thank you for calling Three Bear Lodge. This is Mikkel. But in communities surrounding the park, some business owners say a snow coach only option is not sustainable. Snow coach use and cross country skiing have increased, they say, but not enough to make up for the loss of snowmobilers. And businesses are finding it difficult to stay open in winter. Even some skiers, once at odds with snowmobilers, now worry about losing a diverse winter economy. We all, I feel, have realized that snowmobiles alone aren't, aren't the answer. Snow coaches alone aren't the answer, and skiing alone is not the answer. So we all need to work together to ensure that we have 
a wonderful winter economy that Americans from a nationwide can enjoy, you know, not just a limited few. The Park Service is now writing a new plan to decide just what mix of machines to allow. The new rules are expected to take effect in 2011. For This American Land, I'm Gary Stryker. One of the stories we're working on for a future show. We like using the uh, kibble and fish inside the container. Um, when the container's tipped over, it'll rattle around. It'll help keep the bear's interest. Meet Kobuk the Destroyer. This Alaskan grizzly is a professional can cracker. Thanks for joining us for This American Land. Catch us every week for original stories on important issues affecting America's natural landscapes, waters, and wildlife. We'll see you next time. Funding for This American Land is provided by the Weiss Foundation, the Turner Foundation, the Daniel K. Thorne Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trust, No fun in the sun spring break for these students. Across the globe, millions of amphibians are dying. But are too many snowmobiles threatening the peacefulness of Yellowstone? The amount of machines and the amount of people going into the park skyrocketed. All this and more on This American Land.